we just got thinking about like the people component of it and trying to understand like, okay, all of us here, we're very local to this area in San Diego to Little Italy. Like we lived the Little Italy life. And so mm-hmm. I think it was just like a Friday afternoon. There was Lord knows tons of other things going on. And uh, we just looked at each other. We we're trying to decide between names and thought, why don't we just take it to the streets? Like let's, let's take it to the people. Let's ask the people what they want. And mm-hmm. so we just went down into the piazza and just started polling people. We just approached them and said, hey, you know, we just bought a boutique hotel around the corner. We're really excited for it. We're trying to decide between a name. Um, Would you like to let us know what you think? All right, guys, welcome to another episode of The Report Saturday edition, where we field questions from the listeners and we go deep into certain topics, our favorite topics. Uh, And we got a special guest today, which I'm very excited to bring in. Um, Welcome our co-host. We got Alex Johnson again. Hey, how's it going? Going amazing. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you. Good to be back. Yeah, likewise. (laughs) And uh, we got another co-host today. We got second time on the show, uh, Jennifer Booby. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Excited to be here. Thanks for having me. It's always fun to see some of the behind the scenes when you and Alex do the Saturday edition. So very Mm -hmm. honored to be here on set today. Yeah, absolutely. And it was kind of spur of the moment. We were just hanging and I was (laughs) like, we're getting ready to jump in. I'm like, hey, Jen, you want to jump in? We got some questions for you and we'd love to uh, hear your inputs. Very excited. Yes. And uh, anyway, so with that, um, why don't we jump into it? Uh, Alex, if you want to kick us off. First question comes from Thomas S. Where do you currently see the biggest opportunities over the next 12 months in the real estate investing space? Yeah. So I think there's uh, a lot of opportunities that are going to shake loose, um, specifically in both the boutique hotel space and also in the uh, ADU space. Um, Right now, I think, um, you know, it's important to remember we're in a high interest rate environment. uh, And so there aren't a lot of deals being had. There's not a lot of deals penciling right now uh, in the commercial space. But I always say in order for me to do a deal right now, I need to be able to add tremendous value and I need to be able to buy at a discount. Um, And so with that, um, I think there's two opportunities right now. One is buying in expensive markets where you can legally build ADUs. Um, so here in, uh, California, in a lot of markets in California, you can build, uh, ADUs and in San Diego specifically, um, depending on the zoning of your, uh, lot, you can turn a single family into potentially 50, 60 different units, Mm -hmm. uh, based on the, the lot. Um, and so, you know, this works best in an expensive market. You know, for example, if you're going into a market like Cincinnati or Oklahoma City, uh, where the price per square foot and the comps don't make a lot of sense, it's actually more expensive to build than what the property might be worth. But Mm -hmm. here in an area, uh, let's say some of these good neighborhoods in San Diego, for example, you can build for about 300 bucks a square foot all in. Um, And then some of these uh, property values in terms of the comps are selling for 800 bucks a square foot. So you get to pocket that delta, which is about 500 bucks a square foot. And that's, you know, significant when it comes time to uh, forcing appreciation, quote unquote, um, and adding a lot of value. And so you can do that. And then you have multiple exit strategies. You know, let's say you buy a single family house, you renovate it, you put four ADUs in the back. Now the property is worth significantly more. Mm -hmm. Um, You can do a cash out refinance and you can, you know, rent out the the property long term uh, or you could sell the property or you can buy the property. And we've had guests. um, Andrew Greer was on the show and he talks about doing this. Uh, You can buy a property and get the permits to build all the ADUs. And then instead of doing the build out, you just sell the property to someone else who wants to do the build out with the permits in hand, shovel ready, um, which is appealing as well. So it gives you multiple exit strategies. I know one of the latest deals that we just picked up is here in Little Italy. It's a historic home. Um, We are going to renovate the main house. We're going to build an ADU in the back and then refinance at the higher valuation uh, and then operate both as uh, short-term rentals. So excited for that. Um, And I also think the second uh, play right now where I see the most opportunity, um, not just over the next 12 months, but I kind of see this as an opportunity over the next, you know, five to seven years uh, with all these baby boomers retiring is going in and and picking up boutique hotels. Mm -hmm. Um, We have uh, a lot of short term rental investors out there, as you guys know. Um, It's been a big boom. And a lot of these markets are starting to regulate. You know, we saw New York, uh, what they did a couple of weeks ago. And they um, basically banned all short term rentals in New York City. Mm -hmm. And so as a lot of these markets continue to regulate, it's going to bring more demand to the boutique hotels. But I also think that, you know, all these Airbnb investors 
over the past several years who jumped in, um, the next natural progression for all of them is to get into boutique hotels. I always say, um, you know, if we can, if you can operate three or four short term rentals, um, you can operate a boutique hotel. Mm -hmm. A lot of the same principles apply, um, whether it's the guest communication, managing housekeeping, um, driving good reviews, marketing, pricing strategy, all that stuff translates over to uh, boutique hotels. And then I would say, like, lastly, you know, right now, if you look at these other commercial real estate asset classes, especially multifamily, uh, somewhat overheated. Um, but because there's such a big discrepancy with the mom and pop ran boutique hotels, um, generally speaking, this is going to be $10 million and under. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these mom and pops just they haven't renovated these properties for decades. So that's a value add opportunity for, you know, someone to come in and renovate. Um, and then they're not marketing. Mm -hmm. These mom and pops don't like to market, uh, as you know, Jen. <laughs> um, like, look at the last one that we picked up, uh, the Black Sands Inn. Yes. That seller had owned this hotel for 18 years and was basically just marketing on a direct booking website. And I think they were on, like, one of the OTA platforms. And they had never exceeded $180,000 in any year, over 18 years. Crazy. It is crazy to think about. And so we came in, we renovated it, mm -hmm. and we implemented good uh, operations um, and shout out to, to you and the team for implementing all that stuff. But we took the revenue from 180 to we're going to push 700 this year. That's, That's incredible. In, it's insane, right? Mm -hmm. And so what that does to your, uh, your valuation, because mm -hmm. these, these, uh, boutique hotels are valued based on the income approach. We bought it for 1.5. The seller bought that property in 2003, I want to say for 2 million. And we picked it up 18 years later for 1.5. And in a year through the renovations and our better operations, we took the value from 1.5. It just appraised at 4.5 and a quarter. That's, That's pretty crazy, right? You yeah. can't do that. You can't do that in other asset classes mm -hmm. right now. And so that's why we're going all in on the boutique hotel space. Um, but I, I see that as one of the biggest opportunities um, over the next you know, several years. Anyway, so let's jump into the next question, Alex. Perfect. That kind of leads nicely into the next question that we have here from Sherry. What... What all goes into relaunching a boutique hotel after closing from renovation, redesign, and relaunch with your remote management strategy? Yeah. So, uh, Jen, I really want to get your, your thoughts on a lot of this stuff um, and your expertise. But I would just say to prelude into um, this topic, I think it's important to remember, like, when you close on the, the boutique hotel, you need to figure out, okay, are you going to continue operating for a little bit or are you going to shut down the property right away? Mm -hmm. With the Black Sands Inn up north, we closed in like August, beginning of August, and that's still their busy season. And there was a lot of reservations in the books. And so we thought, well, instead of shutting it down and canceling all those reservations, let's just operate for a couple months until the busy season wears off. One, it will give us a little bit of like reps. It will give us some reps uh, in terms of like how to operate this thing remotely and kind of catch some of the issues and, and some of the stuff before we shut it down. But two, let's capture some of that revenue while it's still busy season and then let's shut it down as the slow season begins. And so we actually didn't begin our renovation until October um, and uh, we renovated it and then relaunched it. But with that, so Jen, like what, I guess when we take over these hotels and we close, I know there's a lot of back end stuff to be mm -hmm. done. What kind of back end stuff are, are you guys doing as we're gearing up to close? Definitely. So I think especially on the understanding of the current operations of the property, like it was key for us to get in with the current management and really try and understand and seek to figure out maybe their practices wouldn't be the best practices that we move forward with in the future, but like, it's really important for us to understand how the, op uh, the hotel was operating at that time. So then we can kind of find some of those points that were really working and really going well, and then other areas that we might potentially improve. I think it was very interesting that we um, decided to stay operating for a couple of months when we closed. I mean, absolutely makes sense with the seasonality of it. I think it was really great learning experience for us as well, um, just getting to take over and I, having it be kind of plug and play and we figuring those things out. Um, but it was really cool because we got to capture all of those guests for those next couple months that had already had their reservations. They were looking forward to staying there. And so I think it's been interesting, like seeing a lot of those guests, we've hit just a year anniversary now of our operations or our 
our ownership. And so it's really cool to see a lot of those guests come back and stay with us. And some of those messages or those reviews that come in that are that are like, we love the location. We love being able to visit here. But now we actually love to stay here mm. because it's good quality. It's good hospitality. And so it's just I mean, I've got chills just thinking <laughs> about like the warm and fuzzies of that hospitality component that now we can give them that place that they've been going to for years and they love to go to and now we can give them a good experience five star stay along with it yeah i love that and i didn't realize how many repeat guests that we yeah. had from when it was original uh to now um but yeah and the property like it, it definitely it looks so <laughs> dialed now i was just yeah. reviewing the uh, the appraisal that just got done and with the appraisal there's a bunch of photos mm -hmm. and i was like checking out the the fire pit area and just like, overlooking the water and i was mm -hmm. I, I didn't even know we had a fire pit <laughs> there but it looks really good. you're like whoa that's nice <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really makes you want to go and stay there as well yeah it does it does um and so as we shut down the property um i know you know at takeover you got mm -hmm. to set up utilities that's one thing um but as we shut down the property for renovations um how did we handle payroll with the uh the housekeeping up there because we did inherit the housekeepers yes and we still have most of them uh, yes all of them? i would say we have majority of them still okay. um there were a few that just had some transitions during different things in their life and so um you know we've brought in new housekeeping especially as the seasons and the um reservations have gotten busier for us at the hotel we've been able to you know bring on and justify bringing on additional housekeeping which has been awesome but andrea on our operations side of things has done an amazing job just like coordinating with all the housekeeping and you know doing a lot of that hiring component as well and so i think it was really amazing for those first couple months that we were operating and then also closed down to still be able to keep housekeeping on and still create that relationship and build that rapport with them because especially with remote management you need to make sure that you have the people in place on site that you can truly trust that are really mm -hmm. going to care about the property and the operations of the property as much as you do and as much as your investors do. And so I think, um, you know, that was really exciting for us to be able to like afford to be able to continue on that relationship with them to give them some sort of income and also to like create and develop that relationship for our management now. So, yeah, I love yeah. that. I love that. Um, so with you know when these things get shut down it's like okay you're not bringing in any income mm -hmm. and so i think one of the the key factors is okay like you better have a good contractor and a good team lined yes. up um and they better be uh synced up with with yourself but also the design team mm -hmm. um and you got to make sure that you're ordering materials that are not going to be on back order so you don't create uh, significant delays um but with that there's always you know i think every real estate project i've ever done things never go according to plan. There's always going to be something that extends the timeline. There's always going to be some sort of change order. So I think it's important to um, factor that into your underwriting on the front end um, and have contingency capital, reserve capital set aside for these change orders. Um, and if you don't end up using it, great. You got additional money that you yep. can return um, to the investors. But if you end up using it, it's like, okay, well, that money's already accounted for, you know. Um, what are some other things that um, maybe you guys are doing on the back end as we're like gearing up for the, the relaunch? Sure. So especially when it comes to uh, starting to market a property that mm -hmm. hasn't previously been marketed on a lot of those other major OTAs or trying to come up with just different marketing components that we can or platforms that we can announce it on. Um, you know, there is a lot of back end and towards researching and understanding like how these different platforms function. Because of course, like all across the board, a lot of the photos are the same. Your copy can traditionally be the same. But when it gets into like very specifics about setting up the listing, like Expedia, for example, has a very interesting way of setting up each individual room. And so you have to be very specific about it and make sure that not only whatever uh, property management system that you're using, you're setting it up correctly in there, but also making sure that you're going in on a, you know, a traditional basis and checking in the platform itself to make sure you're, you know, you're keeping up to date with all the updates. So a lot on like the marketing and back end of those items, especially when it gets into um, you know additional OTAs that you're trying to market on. But I think what I'm really excited about is as we developed the rebrand of the hotel um, after the renovations, like it's been really cool um, implementing some additional uh, features of technology like StayFi, for example. So sending out a lot of those um, email newsletters to those guests, which has helped 
um, capture some of those repeat guests to the property as well. So I think once you've got the operations down and once you know, okay, I can make sure that a guest checks in, okay, they can get to their room, housekeeping is down pat. Like it's really amazing to think about, okay, now how can we grow? How can we think bigger? What other new tools and technology can we implement to make this stay, you know, something that's really enhanced for them? So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, with the San Diego property, um, that one's being renovated right now. Yes. We're gearing up for a relaunch here in about a month. We went a little bit different route with this one. We mm -hmm. hired a brander mm -hmm. to come in and work with us. Um, maybe talk a little bit about what that was like, because I didn't sit in on those meetings, but what sure. was it like working with the brander for this hotel? Hey guys, real quick, the only way this podcast grows is if you guys share it and review the show. So if you do find value, if you could take two seconds and drop a five star on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, it would mean the world to me. But more importantly, it will help us reach new audiences and help more people build wealth through real estate investing. Definitely. Um, so shout out to Nicholas Kreider, who was our brander for this property. I mean, uh, Lauren on our team sourced him and he just did an absolutely incredible job with guiding us through a lot of those questions that maybe on our end of things, like we're operations people, we're, you know, raising capital people, we're, we're real estate people. Mm -hmm. And so it's very interesting to like get to know from his creative perspective and from his experience working with a lot of major brands and and boutique brands as well. Like a lot of those questions that he guided us through, we did so many brainstorming sessions, um, uh, talking about just different properties that inspired us, different directions we wanted to go in. And I think developing and figuring a lot of that out on the front end is really key to making sure that you're setting yourself up for a successful relaunch, not just with the physical component to the property, but also a lot of the marketing and brand development as well. Yeah, so. absolutely. And I think I kind of I kind of got involved towards the end when yeah. you guys had like, uh, the, you were down to like the last couple, maybe like four or yeah. five mm -hmm. name ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so that was kind of fun. fun. <laughs> I know you guys did a bunch of exercises yep. like coming up with it. <laughs> but I think like it's important to remember for anyone out there, if you're like renaming a hotel, mm -hmm. um, you really want to come up with a name that has an available URL so you, you can get the, the domain yeah. um, and then has an available Instagram handle. Yes. So if you pick something that's like very generic, mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to get the handle. And um, so... That is is one of the tricky parts, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so that was kind of like when we got down to the last four or five, yeah. that was almost like the determining factor for us. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of finding out which ones had. And so we ended up going with the hotels in Dell. Yes. And just so happened that hotels in Dell Instagram handle was available. It was, for some reason, we're trying to recover it right yes. now. What's going on there? I don't know. Shout out to Meta if you're listening or someone <laughs> on the Meta team, please help us. Um, we're working on recovering. Um, what What is happening right now is I guess uh, their AI was doing a sweep of all these potential mm -hmm. bot accounts and they flagged ours as potentially a bot. And so working on recovering that and we will have it back up and running, ready for some beautiful photos and some new posts. But I'm really excited when you talk about like the naming components and some of the exercises that we did during that part of the brand development. Cause we actually, we got down to that, you know, last handful mm -hmm. of, of names that we were trying to decide between and you know, Nicholas had done an amazing job of vetting them and making sure that, you know, that we weren't going to be hit with a lot of competition in the area that even sounded similar, that it was appropriate for the target market that we were uh, mm -hmm. planning to um, market to. But then we just got thinking about like the people component of it and trying to understand like, OK, all of us here, we're very local to this area in San Diego to Little Italy. Like we live the Little Italy life. And so mm -hmm. I think especially with this property being so close to our hearts, like it was important to us to be able to go out into the community and take a poll and get an idea of what, what other people thought about our potential names. So we were actually, we were sitting here in the office and um, gosh, it was like, it was like, it's like a Friday, it was amazing. I think, I, yeah. One of my all time favorite, um, <laughs> Yeah, one of my favorite, and we've done a lot of amazing things here, but like one of my favorite things that we've ever done fun. as a team, um, I think it was just like a Friday afternoon. There was, Lord knows, tons of other things going on. And uh, we just looked at each other. We're trying to decide between names and thought, why don't we just take it to the streets? Like, let's let's take it to the people. Let's ask the people what they want. And mm -hmm. so um, I think Alex or Lauren ran to Office Depot or Rite Aid or something like that, got a couple pieces of foam board and... Um, we printed out the different names that we were thinking of going with and we just went down into the piazza and just started polling people, just asking people. We just approached them and said, hey, you know, we just bought a boutique hotel around the corner. We're really excited for it. We're trying to decide between a name. Um, would you like to let us know what you think? Would you like to give it a shot? And so it was really cool seeing some of the different votes and 
actually, I still, because I, I love to spend a lot of time in the piazza, and I still run into people. I uh, ran into someone the other day who was like, hey, like, have you guys opened that hotel yet? And they yeah. asked, because um, this was a while back, they asked now if we had decided on the name. And so I told them <laughs> it was Hotel Zindel. And believe it or not, they were like, I love it. That was my choice. <laughs> so it's really nice. amazing just to like, I think, you know, especially in such a big city as San Diego, like Little Italy is extremely special because it has that small town, that community feel. And so mm -hmm. I think even the fact that we were out there and, um, you know, we're able to get other people excited and energized about our project and what we're working on was really cool. We even got a shout out to Sam, the cooking guy, mm -hmm. um, oh, who has right. a couple of restaurants out there. He yep. gave a little vote for what he thought the hotel name would be. And so just a really fun um, activation that we did and really cool, again, portion of branding exercise that was fun for us yeah and uh for the listeners that don't know <laughs> jen you know everyone in the, in the neighborhood <laughs> like literally I've everyone made a lot we, of everywhere you go oh, everyone knows you <laughs> well I, I like to talk to people yeah. and i think um one of the coolest experiences was when i first moved here got involved with a frost meat cafe and bakery and so just like getting to meet all of these different people from all different kinds of backgrounds coming into the coffee shop mm -hmm. and um, you know, just wanting to start out their days on a good note, like you could just get to talking with people and then one thing leads to another. And I, yeah, it, it's tough sometimes to walk down the street without running into someone that I know. And I love that. It Do you still remember home. everyone's order? Oh gosh. Um, definitely our regulars. I think <laughs> there are some people that really like to spice things up every once in a while. So for those wild cards out there, I'll remember you and I'll remember kind of the direction of your order, but mm -hmm. <laughs> And so uh, with this, the San Diego property, um, with this relaunch, we're yes. doing a few things uh, different uh, mm -hmm. in addition. So we're going to do a soft opening yes. with our investors and with like our friends and family. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the next day, I'm assuming it will be the following day, we'll do the grand opening. Uh, we'll invite the uh, the neighborhood. We'll yep. invite the general public. Yep. And then um, we were thinking we we're going to offer some free stays too. Uh, some influencers in the space that have some pull. Um, in return, they do some content on their mm -hmm. socials um, on the hotel. So excited for that and excited to kind of see what we come up with. Um, but what, uh, on your end, what, what are some of the other differences um, that go into the relaunch of this San Diego property versus um, the Black Sands Inn? Absolutely. So especially with this one being in our neighborhood and, you know, us having already worked with the contractor and the designer that are working on this property as well. Like we really were able to dive a lot deeper into the experience side of the property. You know, Black Sands is a very beautiful property. It's very aesthetically pleasing. But with this one, we were really focusing in on, OK, how can we make people really feel something when they step into the property? How can we really help them to experience like uh, the meaning behind our brand and, you know, the excitement that you can find here in Little Italy. And so I think uh, definitely on the design portion of things, we've been able to push that a little bit further and get a lot more creative with the kinds of amenities and things that we're offering. And then another component to it that's a little bit different, um, because of the remoteness of the property in Black Sands, we've done some limited like local partnerships, which has been awesome. But here in Little Italy, you have access to absolutely anything you could possibly dream of. And so what's really fun about what we're doing with this property is focusing a lot on community partnerships and how we can really involve and incentivize a lot of these other businesses to, well, for our guests to go and to experience maybe some of our favorite restaurants or, you know, we have bike rentals here in town. We have all sorts of really cool experiences. And so we're finding ways to really incorporate that into the guest experience so that when they come here, uh, you know, they feel like they're experiencing the little Italy life from a local pr perspective. So. Mm. Yeah, it's funny because like I, I haven't had a chance to do a, a ton of San Diego uh, projects yeah. until recently. And now I'm like, man, this is so cool. <laughs> we could just like walk six blocks down the road and yes. check in on the renovation. Yes. You know, and so, man, it, it, it really is nice to do deals, um, you know, in, in your backyard, assuming you live in a market that's conducive with, um, you know, your investment strategy. In San Definitely. Diego right now, I'm very bullish on. So that's kind of a win-win. Yeah, it's very exciting. And I think... Um, you know, you spoke a little bit earlier about how a lot of these short-term rentals um, with the, the stringent regulations or maybe oversaturation, like boutique hotels are the next natural progression for investors to get into. And I think especially when we're talking about like 
reopening your eyes to the market that you're surrounded by, like, I think it's going to be so amazing seeing a lot of those previously short-term rental investors to break into the boutique hotel space because Mm -hmm. a lot of those short-term rentals, you know, they get so creative and they get so innovative with the different amenities that they're offering or the designs. And so I think are ways that they serve hospitality. And so I think with bringing them into the boutique hotel space, you know, that um, field is only going to get better and only going to get more exciting and enigmatic for people to experience instead of it just being like staying at a random chain hotel or like I I think people are now starting to think beyond okay we have a clean stay we have a nice smooth check-in you know guests are going to be able to trust that they're going to have a nice room that's all to themselves and now we're really getting to focus in and hone in on like how can we take that hospitality to the next level and really deliver them something that's going to be memorable yeah mm -hmm. absolutely very exciting for me to see so a question for you so you know this this San Diego property is 24 units Yes. Um, the Black Sands Inn is 10. And yes. so from a remote management standpoint, this is going to be two and a half uh, times mm-hmm. the amount of rooms and guests checking in and checking out. Um, what kind of challenges do you kind of foresee the difference from the Black Sands Inn to, to now 24 units remotely? Definitely. So I think especially even thinking about not only the scope and size, but also the the structure of this property here in San Diego, we have a lot more common areas, a lot more amenity spaces that are going to be utilized as well. So I think one of the main factors that we like to consider is access to the property. Like up in Black Sands, um, everyone accesses their room from an exterior door. And so, you know, you have very limited interaction or contact or, you know, potentially conflict with uh, other guests. And then this property in particular, everyone has one main um, access point to get into the property and then they go to their individual rooms. So a couple of things that we've kind of soft soft implementing um, at the property up in uh, Shelter Cove Mm -hmm. is doing a lot more when it comes to instructions for check-in. So like creating walkthrough videos, um, doing different things with maps, like making sure that no matter what style of um, listener or conversationalist you are, like a lot of people are visual, a lot of people are, um, you know, more audible. So Mm -hmm. I I think that there are lots of different ways that people (laughs) assimilate information. And so I think that um, us trying to figure that out and make sure we have all those bases covered, like whether you'd like to see how to get somewhere or whether you'd like to read how to be able to do it, like making sure we have all those bases covered. um, I think that's going to be key to making sure that, you know, guests have a very easy access into the property. Um, Other than that, I mean, our operations team has got things done. Pat, we just hired on another VA in addition to the two amazing VAs that we've had on our team for over a year now. And so I think they're really excited and really looking forward to the growth. Um, Another thing that definitely picks up as we start to take on more boutique hotels is the communications component. So we figured out a lot of ways to automate a lot of our messages Mm -hmm. going out, figuring out different ways to really make that a little bit more efficient. But I think our VAs and our team overall is getting a lot um, more efficient or, um, you know, just being able to communicate very easily and make sure they have access to all the information that they need. So when a guest has a question, you know, there's not a lot of delay. There's not any back and forth. They just, they receive the answer right away. So, um, you know, I definitely think it's something that these two hotels we're managing right now are, are helping us to develop for this new acquisition. But I mean, I think whether it's one room or whether it's 20, like the same principles and ideas can apply. Yeah. I'm really excited to see what, how much we are able to increase the revenue of Mm -hmm. this property. So when we bought it, the previous ownership was doing about 750 a year. Um, And I think that we can push 1.7. Yes. So for us to increase it by, you know, two and a half, three X is going to be huge. So Definitely. we'll see. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a growing market. It's a neighborhood that is the trendiest neighborhood in all of San Diego. Mm-hmm. We're on the busiest street in San Diego yep. because it connects the San Diego airport to the five freeway. Um, about 30,000 cars that drive by every 24 hours um, that are going to see this hotel. And so just by us putting in some good uplighting and some new signage uh, is going to be free marketing and get a lot of eyeballs on the property. But in addition to that, we're going to be pushing all the different marketing levers, the OTA platform, mm-hmm. social media, our direct booking website. Um, and also, I mean, we're, we're more of a presence in the neighborhood now. So excited Definitely. to kind of see uh, what comes out of it. 
Um, and I'm excited to do more uh, boutique hotel deals and hopefully we can buy some more here in San Diego as well because I'm really loving it. <laughs> Would love it. And I think too with this property, it's really exciting because like you were alluding to, it has so much potential and there's so much that it could truly be. And I think when we were going through that initial transition of ownership, I mean, just speaking with uh, some of the previous management, like they even had a fondness for the property. They just didn't have the energy or the capacity to really bring it to its full potential. So I've been talking with them about like how the property performed or how it was like even before COVID. And mm -hmm. then just to kind of see that drop off. So really excited. It's got beautiful bones. It now has an incredible design. Um, the furnishings are going to be fantastic. Hospitality is going to be amazing. So really excited to bring it back to its full potential. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just crazy to think like, you know, I've been in this neighborhood for seven years mm -hmm. now. And so to think like we own uh, a hotel in this neighborhood is, is so cool to think about. It's incredible. You know, with our investors. It's, it's already inspiring. looking yeah. so good too. Like just walking it, just seeing everything that's already gone in. I mean, it's a little bit to go, but it's it's already transforming. I think the seller's, like Jen alluded to, you know, they're just ready to let it go. And I, I know one thing is they, they were excited for us to buy it um, just because they were excited to see like what we could do. And it's, it's really neat just being more so a part of the community now, just with like all of our events and everything we do, you know, very locally. Um, and just to see the community excited about it. Mm -hmm. I think that's really special. I agree. I mean, it was uh, a neglected property when we took over. Mm -hmm. It had, you know, some of the units had bed bugs. We had, um, <laughs> you know, transient tenants that had been there yeah. for not tenants, but guests that had been there for more sure. than 30 days. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, with the California landlord tenant laws, you know, if a guest there more than 30 days, now they're, you know, technically tenants. So we had a couple squatters we had to deal with, <laughs> but, um, you know, we dealt with it. And um, now we're almost done with the renovation and we're down to, you know, some, some final punch list items and get the, the furnishings in there and, I'm excited to see this thing, um, you know, relaunch and see what we can do with it. Likewise. Yeah. Good times. Next topic. What do we got, Alex? All right. Last but not least, Daniel, what type of experience should should someone have before buying a boutique hotel? Yeah. So I, I think it's important to have um, some experience in the short term rental space. Um, doesn't need to be 10 Airbnbs, but, you know, if you have a couple deals or maybe you arbitrage a deal or mm -hmm. two. Um, or maybe you have some co-hosting experience. I think just to have uh, your feet wet um, with the operations, the guest communications, understanding pricing strategy, understanding how to market, um, understanding like what components are going to uh, be the biggest list in terms of like growing revenue and attracting guests um, and driving five-star reviews. I, I think those fundamentals transition over. Um, I also think there's um, fundamentals from the commercial real estate side that transition over as well. So um, what do I mean by that? I mean like networking with brokers, sourcing deals, underwriting deals, knowing how to uh, secure lending, how uh, to, you know, renovate, mm -hmm. how to operate, how to, um, you know, really put these deals together and these business plans. There's a lot of stuff on the commercial side that goes into it. So I would say a good candidate would be either someone that has experience on the commercial side. Maybe mm -hmm. they've done some multifamily deals. It's not that much different than a boutique hotel. It's mm -hmm. just now you're dealing with nightly guests versus long-term tenants um, or someone that has some short-term rental experience. I would say one or the other. Um, we were lucky because we had both when we, when, we, when we pivoted over to the boutique hotel stuff. So I put together multifamily deals. I'd put together syndications. So I knew how all that back end stuff worked. And then we we had our short term rental stuff. We were already managing and operating short term rentals. Um, I think in like seven or eight markets when we decided mm -hmm. to pivot. And so, you know, if you may I always say like if you marry the two, mm -hmm. the short term rental and a and a multifamily <laughs> yeah. deal, it's, it's really a boutique hotel. And so um that pivot was very organic and it happened very naturally. Um, so I would say, you know, you don't need to have both, but I would say one or the other is probably um, sufficient. What do you guys think? Definitely. And I think that's a beautiful way of putting it. I think, you know, as you were talking about and just setting the foundation and like making sure that you just have your feet wet into that into that field, into that area, like a lot of the other tools like you can learn or someone can teach you or you can have some kind of a mentorship. Um, but as long as you have that like mindset, I think that's really key to being successful in the boutique hotel space. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, for the folks out there, if you guys want to learn more about our boutique hotel investing mastermind where we 
um, have a community of folks that are mm -hmm. partnering. They're taking down Boutique Hotel deals. Uh, you can go to summerscapital.com slash mastermind, um, or you can go to my Instagram handle uh, at rich underscore summers and click the link. There's a button there uh, to inquire about our mastermind. But with that, um, yeah, I'm loving the Saturday editions. <laughs> and, I, and we've been getting some really good feedback from the listeners um, regarding these episodes. I like how they're kind of short and just like informative and to the point. Yeah, a little bite-sized nuggets for people. I think sometimes, you know, you just want something easy, easy to digest. And um, we love how it's interactive as well. You know, we we love all of our guests. They're, they're awesome. But yeah, we like hearing from you guys and what you want to hear about. I mean, the show is really to help you guys and, you know, give you the information that you want. So yeah, we, we appreciate you guys uh, sending the questions in. Yeah, likewise. Um, and I appreciate you ladies jumping in. Jen. Always a pleasure. On the fly. Always a pleasure. <laughs> She's always ready to go. <laughs> yes. Uh, but with that, listeners, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you in the next one. Peace. Peace.